So, picture the scene. The year is 1920, and 21 foreign imperialist armies have invaded the Soviet Union, the first workers' state in history. At the same time, a revolutionary wave is spreading through Europe. In Germany, the workers have almost seized power. In Hungary, they、uh, held it shortly. Italy, wave of factory occupations taking place. And in 1920, the one-year-old Communist International meets for its second Congress. Now, the Second Congress is quite an intense affair. It is 19 days long, with 220 delegates attending from all across the world. Just to give a few countries, give a sense of the scale、uh, of this event, you've got delegates in Europe, from France, from Britain, from Germany. In、uh, Asia, you've got countries、uh, delegates as far away as India, Indonesia, Korea. You even have delegate、uh, in Persia. And you even have delegates from Mexico and the USA, and many, many others. There's 54 different parties represented in one way or another. And comrades had risked their lives to attend,、uh, whilst people have had to bring their own campsites、uh, to this event.、Um, in the、uh, Second Congress, there were comrades who had to bring their own food and supplies because of the、uh, blockades that Russia faced at this time. In fact, three French delegates were drowned in transit,、uh, trying to, you know, make the revolutionary sacrifice to attend this、uh, congress. Now, any of you have the,、uh, ever attended trade union works,、uh, you'll know that when you go to a congress, you're greeted by four-star hotels,、uh, free meals. Uh, 35 pound expenditure per day on food, which is wonderful.、Uh, these comrades, however, they were of a different and harder sort, and instead they got two 100-page books to read: left-wing communism and terrorism and communism.、Um, now we're going to look at the first of those ones: left-wing communism, infantile disorder, by Lenin, which is of course in Classics Volume Two, and I highly recommend. That comrades、uh, read it if you haven't already. So the first thing that comrades often hear when they hear about this idea of left-wing communism、uh, is they think, well, this "Isn't that good? Like, don't you want to be a left-wing communist? Why? Why wouldn't you? Want, why would you want to be a right-wing communist? That sounds terrible."、Um, but、uh, no, instead, left-wing communism is this idea of basically making tactical questions into principled questions. It is,、uh, you know, rather than trying to find a way to the masses,、um, is instead kind of seeing everything in this fixed and static form. And so, whilst Lenin's method was unwaveringly firm in principle, never even giving an inch in principle, he was infinitely flexible in tactics.、Um, now, these ultra-left、uh, ideas or left-wing communist ideas.、Um, Were very very widespread throughout the Communist International. For example, you had the、uh, question of the German Communist Party, who had basically made this question of if we boycott Parliament, which for Marxists is a tactical question, into a principled one. They said you must never work within bourgeois parliaments, and in doing so, refused to get involved in the National Assembly, which 85% of German workers were participating in. Um, you also had the same party took a similar position in trade unions. They said it is a principal question for Marxists to never sully themselves in the reactionary trade unions with their right wing leadership, despite the fact that again the masses of workers were involved in the、uh, right wing trade unions.、Um, in fact, it wasn't just Germany, however, that took this ultra left approach. You saw the same thing throughout the、uh, international. Most famously, you had the、uh, comrades coming from the old IWW, the International Workers of the World, based in the United States, who took the position that no、uh, good worker would ever be found in the、uh, American trade union、uh, trade unions, the AFL-CIO, and instead that the comrades should again remain apart from it. And you even had the same、uh, similar idea in Britain. Where the young British Communist Party said it is impermissible for Marxists to ever work within the Labour Party.、Um, again, treating this as a fixed、uh, principle rather than a flexible tactical question.
Now, um, these were the moves that therefore were far across the Communist International. Um, and these groups positioned themselves as less com left communists in uh, comparison with Lenin. And Lenin was keen, therefore, to really tackle these ideas. Now, these ideas, however, didn't just exist uh, back then. They actually exist widespread throughout the uh, communist and uh, left-wing movements today. We see this when people say that right-wing trade union leaders always betray the working class, therefore never participate in trade unions, a left communist uh, position. Or that the masses in the working class um, uh, are in the trade unions and therefore revolutionaries must always prioritize the trade union struggle, uh, a film or things that are called economism that Lenin would deal with in 1903, what is to be done. Uh, we see that people who say that the Labour Party is a reformist party or a bourgeois party, and therefore we should never support it or work with it regardless of conditions. Or people who demand that the nuclear family is a product of bourgeois society, which is correct. Therefore, the call of revolutionary should be for its immediate abolition, um, which obviously gets you nowhere. Um, and similarly, you see it on things as widespread as well, um, of the question of the need for uh, uh, national independence, when people say we need to protect the rights of nations to self-determination, therefore we must support all nationalist movements. Um, in fact, you can see that ultra-left ideas, they aren't just confined to trade unions or uh, political parties, but instead can uh, express themselves in any and all tactical questions, because ultimately it isn't about this or that position, but it is about the method of how you arrive there. Do you, again, have this fixed and inflexible position? Uh, whilst Lenin's method was, again, this unflinching on principle, infinitely flexible on tactics. Um, so ultra-lefts mistake this tactical question for principle ones. And in doing so, the ir irony is they actually end up diluting uh, principle questions. Again, think of all the sectarian groups that take their starting point. We must never work within the Labour Party. Um, okay, they take this uh, approach, but then in the Corbyn movement, what do we see? The masses move towards the Labour Party. So what do these ultra-left groups have to do in order to try and appeal to the masses? Is that they water down their program, adopting demands with the broadest possible appeal. Uh, you know, demands uh, just basically like, oh, we just need to fight racism, like, uh, or we just need to uh, fight for a £10 uh, living wage or whatever. Uh, very widespread demands here, but don't actually raise consciousness. This watering down of uh, ideas is effectively what we would call opportunism. Um, and rather than ultra-leftism, this uh, being incredibly firm on tactics, and opportunism, which is watering down your principles, being uh, opposites. Instead, they are two sides of the same coin, both going uh, into each other and both deriving from a failure to understand the ideas and methods of genuine Bolshevism. Now, some ultra-lefts will uh, see this and they'll say, okay, we need to avoid opportunism. Um, and therefore, we have to be firm on our tactics and if our tactics cannot reach the masses, then so be it. Um, and they say, let's just <laughs> uh, isolate themselves from the masses rather than attempting to merge and win the most advanced layers. Um, now, in isolating themselves, they develop interests apart from the masses and they fall into the trap of sectarianism. Now, people often use this word sectarianism. Um, and I think there's a bit of confusion. You know, some people think, oh, is this just a word for small groups? Or is it just a word for people we don't like? Um, it definitely is a word for people you don't like in the sense that don't call people a sectarian, as I found out to my dismay once, uh, that people don't like being called that. However, <laughs> that was, uh, I think it was three months in the organization. It was an interesting time. Um, <laughs> Sectarianism is, uh, it is actually a scientific word. It is placing the interests of their small groups above the interests of the masses as a whole, i.e. above the interests of the socialist revolution. Now, there are many, many examples that people can use, and I hope maybe a few people come in with their own. Um, but I think really a textbook one can be found in the uh, French presidential elections last year. Uh, during this uh, French presidential election, 
you had uh, basically three main candidates going up. You had Le Pen, who's a far-right demagogue. You had Macron, who is a banker. And then you had Mélenchon, who was a left reformist, but had massive widespread uh, support amongst the working class, and there were major illusions. Obviously, him getting into uh, power, even the second round, would be a major step forward for the working class, rather than splitting them between the uh, banker and the uh, bigot. Um, However, what you saw is that the French Communist Party, rather than supporting uh, Mélenchon, uh, actually decided to run their own candidate. They were like, no, we need to you know, have this independent position. They run their own candidate in the election and they get 2.5% of the votes. Um, fair enough, this achieved very little, except it was enough to ensure that Macron, uh, Mélenchon became behind Le Pen uh, didn't get into the second round of elections, and instead the French masses were forced to choose between uh, Macron and Le Pen in the, in the final. This is a sectarian position. Why did they run? Did they run for the broad interests of the working class? Did they run to raise class consciousness? Or did they just run for their own positions, for their own prestige? Uh, and because ultimately they saw it not as a question of the interests of the working class as a whole and the seizure of power, but instead which party gets to uh, have this or that position. A sect is not a question of size, uh, as maybe some comrades sometimes imply when they say the word other sex, which uh, you know, triggers me slightly. Um, but instead a question of whose interests do you represent? the long-term interests of the working class as a whole, or your own career's position or, ex uh, uh, ooh, uh, your own career's pers uh, position and prestige due to your isolation of the uh, masses? Do you turn temporary isolation into a principle and refuse to link up with the masses? So to summarize a few of these terms, uh, ultra-leftism, turning secondary questions into uh, tax uh, into rigid principle questions, failing to connect with consciousness where it is. Opportunism, political softness, adapting to the pressure of alien class ideas and diluting your ideas down to reach the broader layers. And sectarianism, failing to connect the general theoretical conclusions with the living real processes of the class. Starting from the world as you'd like it to be rather than how it actually is, and in doing so, isolating yourself from the masses putting your own interests above those of the class. Now, there's no Chinese wall between any of these. In fact, they are continually changing and moving into one another. Uh, you can be a sectarian, an opportunist, and an ultra-left all at the same time and all in quick succession. And there are many groups who try their best to demonstrate this in practice, <laughs> which, uh, again, comrades can come in in more detail. Um, instead, it under... It, is all from this mistaken method, this method of Bolshevism, of being unflinching in principle, infinitely flexible in tactics. So, the question that you probably now have, well, what actually are the principles of Bolshevism? Uh, what do we have to be incredibly firm in? If it isn't our position to a national question, if it isn't our position to the Labour Party, to the trade unions, or to any of these uh, other things. Well, the role of the Revolutionary Party can be summarized in this. It is to raise the consciousness of the workers from their own experience to draw the necessary conclusions. Those conclusions are that our world is fundamentally split in to uh, two major classes, the uh, proletariat and the bourgeoisie, uh, that these classes are completely irreconcilable and there is a question of class war between them. And not only there is this question of class war, but that society is completely controlled by the bourgeoisie. That the state is their state. The police are their police. The courts are their courts. The factory, the, uh, the factories out there are the factories of the ruling class. The, um, uh, the entire society operates for the logic of the ruling class and therefore the role of the workers to achieve their own liberation is the uh, to unite as uh, one and to overthrow the ruling class and establish a uh, socialist society based on the democratic uh, running of society by the working class and the institution of a planned economy. Those are our principles. Everything that is done to raise workers to this conclusion is progressive 
everything that uh, fails to do this is therefore fundamentally uh, uh, reactionary. And this idea is fundamentally the uh, key aspect of our organization and others. You know, a lot of people, like you see, hear them kind of talking, like contact will come up and they'll say, uh, what's the difference between your organization and this one or that one or this one? And some people will say, ah, oh, we really focus on education. Um, now, that's obviously true, but it's very much a one-sided thing. Um, and it, it doesn't grasp the full idea. Instead, the goal of our organization is to raise the consciousness of the class at all times. That is the fundamental thing, which, of course, and we'll go into many reasons, you need a very strong political level uh, to do. Um, now, in this respect, capitalism does a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Uh, and we, we should thank the capitalists for how they create class struggle in the workplace, leading people to conclude that there can be no peace with the bourgeoisie. How their entire system is fermented with political crises and economic crises, one after the uh, other, ensuring that anyone who wants to build a peaceful life or any worker who aims to be build a peaceful life will see that life coming down like a house of cards and will be forced to draw the conclusion that something must be done. Revolutionaries then seek to assist the workers to bring out all of these innate conclusions against the reformists and the bourgeoisie. Um, now we understand that consciousness is not a straight line. Um, whilst opportunists attempt to meet consciousness where it is, and go no further, and ultra-lefts fly straight over heads and find themselves in the clouds, we understand that you need to be tactical, that uh, consciousness doesn't raise linearly, but instead all, nor all at once. There were workers today who've reached very extreme conclusions, which our Are You a Communist campaign is very much aimed at. We'll get into a bit more detail there. There were other workers, you know, who are outright supporting the uh, Tory party. Uh, well, maybe not at the moment. It seems like no one's supporting the Tory party. Um, but there are workers who, you know, consciousness is a very complicated thing. There are others who are completely burnt out. We need to be able to flexible and to meet people where they are and raise them regardless of their, uh, of their level. Um, and it's for this reason that uh, we employ these ideas of, uh, of transitional demands. Now, I want to look into this example. So as we all know, there is a uh, pay struggle going on today across uh, huge numbers of uh, different workers due to inflation. Now, many different demands are raised about, uh, about this. Uh, whilst the opportunists are going to demand, they will just say, we demand a pay rise. Now, this isn't wrong, uh, but how does that raise consciousness? Uh, only the most reactionary worker is going to say, ah, no, I, I think we need a pay cut. <laughs> um, everyone agrees with this. As there's another example, I was on uh, the NEU strikes the other day, uh, and some groups were saying the demand strike for education at the NEU strikes. So I was like, I think everyone agrees with this. Um, but uh, yeah, it doesn't move this question closer to the conclusions of socialism at all. Alternatively, this more ultra-left slogan could be saying, well, we need to abolish the wage system and instead completely, you know, have a communist society. Now, that is completely correct in the sense of communism would solve all of the current wage disputes. Um, but apart from those who are convinced of uh, communism already, this demand is completely abstract and removed from the slidings, uh, from the uh, struggle of uh, the day. So instead, as Marxists, we need to link these minimum demands here to the maximum program. And we put forward this idea of the sliding scale of wages, uh, i.e. that wages should rise with uh, inflation automatically. Um, and the goal is to link up, let's see, many workers would accept this, they think, okay, yep, yeah, that's a great idea. But then in trying to carry it out, they will go further uh, than the bourgeois system allows. They will come into the contradictions of bourgeois property relations. They will come into the realities of the uh, nature of the state, uh, and they will need to forge class unity in order to achieve this. It's about seeing not a demand as a fixed thing, but as a process of how that raises the living struggle of the, uh, of the masses. Uh, we might also, depending on the situation, add, um, you know, add to this, saying that, well, how is this going to be paid for? 
by, you know, massively uh, nationalizing the major monopolies and all of this. Well, again, in and of itself, is that revolutionary? You know, we see nationalizations take place uh, throughout the history of capitalism. But if that was attempted to be carried out, that would bring the workers into effectively civil war with the capitalists who would do everything in their power to maintain their profits and therefore raise the consciousness of the class. Similarly, we might add the demand to open the books, um, i.e. that we could see exactly where the money is being spent. Now, is that again a particularly you know, communist demand in that respect? Not, uh, not entirely. In fact, it could be achieved under capitalism. But its achievement would massively heighten the class contradictions as people would see that their wages and the profits are completely in inverse proportion uh, and one far bigger than the, uh, than the other. Now, this is the uh, idea of transitional demands outlined in the transitional program, um, which is to uh, meet the movement where it is and then if implemented to go beyond those uh, conclusions, the conclusion of socialist revolution. However, a common mistake is to then think that transitional uh, demands are for the same for all times. That to avoid ultra-leftism, all you need to do is just memorize the demands in the back of the Communist Manifesto, transitional program, and occasionally say bread, peace, and land. Um, peace, land, and bread. Or, or that, or that will work as well. Um, no, the uh, demands... Um, instead, actually, we need to think very flexibly. In fact, that would actually be an ultra-left attitude in many respects, because it would see these uh, demands as fixed and rigid and eternal for all times. Actually, if you look at the demands in the uh, you know, Communist Manifesto, what are some of the demands that Marx raises? He talks about a heavy income tax and free comprehensive education. You could possibly even maybe just able to get this past Starmer. Um, <laughs> alternatively, the demands of the Chartists um, included free and democratic elections, uh, you know, in 1839. Actually, again, even the Green Party would probably support this. But the question about when they were implemented in that context, these actually required a major revolutionary struggle and the Chartists with demands, whilst today, you know, would seem uh, effectively left liberal, in those conditions led to an insurrection by the working class in Newport in 1839. Conversely, consider the demands of the uh, Labour government in 1945, where Clement Attlee, you know, actually instituted the uh, NHS, a National Health Service free at the point of use, funded by all of this. Um, you know, today, to actually fight for a free, fully funded uh, uh, NHS itself could even be a transitional demand, given the immense crisis of British capitalism. Instead, the key is to, uh, to determine correct transitional demands. You need to speak to workers, to listen to them, and to test out different strategies and use the experience of the Marxist movement. You both need to understand the subjective consciousness of the workers in front of you, but the, and also the objective conditions and how one interacting with the other will lead to certain conclusions and see that as the development of the movement as a whole. In this respect, there is no recipe book, um, and instead you need comrades who can think for themselves. Lenin is saying in left-wing communism that the communists must have the ability to link up and maintain the closest contact. And if you wish, merge in certain measures with the uh, broadest masses of the working people. I you need to be able to listen to people, to talk to people in a, in a normal and conversational manner, uh, whether that be in a picket line, in your workplace, in your universities, um, and to be able to draw out consciousness from there. That is the skill of the, uh, of the transitional program. Common sense. Uh, you know, you should be able to talk to people and listen to people. Um, it's not particularly profound. And yet, again, I would A, argue that the failure to understand left-wing uh, communism is one of the, uh, you know, major failures of the uh, different left-wing movements across the uh, uh, world today. But the other question is, well, where does these uh, other ideas come from then? And what we would actually say is that, you know, many people who draw these ultra left conclusions are not doing it, uh, you know, out of malice or ignorance, but doing it instead from a very healthy place because of the betrayal, uh, and the scandals of the reformist leaders. 
let's take a look again, historically, the ultra left that Lenin was arguing against. Uh, you know, he looked at like people like the KPD, the Communist Party of Germany, um, which had drawn very ultra left conclusions. But why had they done this? It was because the reformists of the past, of the social, uh, reformist leaders of the Social uh, Democratic Party, uh, had led in 1914 the world into the complete horrors of World War I. In 1919, had executed Karl uh, Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, their uh, former comrades, um, and had uh, effectively completely destroyed the Second International. Is it really coming from a negative place? Uh, that, uh, you know, people are saying we cannot work with these people. Is it coming from a negative place that when they're saying, you know, we can't be involved in any way and we need true party, uh, true independence in the most, uh, uh, clear form possible? No. Um, instead, this is coming from a very healthy place. And Lenin, you know, tries to sympathize with the ultra lefts. Instead, you can look at the same thing today. You know, think of, let's say, all the people who, uh, let's say, look at the, um, uh, Starmer and the Labour Party. You know, anyone who's coming, uh, from that and says, you know, we need a, uh, you know, a revolutionary party which is completely removed from these, uh, uh, you know, charlatans in the trade unions, the charlatans in the, uh, Labour Party. That is a very healthy perspective to have. But the key for Lenin, therefore, wasn't to cascade these individuals, but instead to win them round and turn them out to the movement, to steal them in uh, Marxist ideas, and then to give them the ability to go and convince others. Again, socialism for us isn't just a nice idea we talk about amongst ourselves. It is a tool to go and reach the masses and to uh, you know, actually uh, change society. Um, and uh, so therefore, when someone comes up to us today and says Starmer is a bourgeois reactionary, it would be a massive mistake for anyone to turn around and say, oh, well, actually, the Labour Party is the mass party of the working class, uh, you know, and uh, we've, we've got to take this position. No, we'd say, yes, he is. He is completely in the hands of big business. He is leading, uh, you know, the trade union. Well, it's not even leading the trade unions up Land Alley at this point. He's very open about what he's going to do. Uh, you know, he's going to massively attack the, uh, attack the working class. We need to try and win the workers away from this person who is in the hand of the puppeteer or no, the puppet of the, of the big bourgeoisie. Um, similarly, if someone came up to us and said, uh, oh, what's the word? Do you know, uh, ACAB, like, uh, all cops are, are bastards. Um, we're not going to then turn around and say, oh, well, actually, some of them, you know, workers in uniform and in a revolutionary situation could split across class lines. You know, and Trotsky said a third will go to the revolution, a third, uh, this way, etc." No, we would say, yeah, we completely agree. The police are a racist institution. They defend uh, the upholding of uh, private property, um, but they are simply one element of the entire capitalist state, uh, which is, uh, you know, and simply one tool which is completely rotten from top to bottom. Our position has to be to therefore seal a revolutionary party against this and then to reach out and win the masses even if they have illusions in Starmer, even if they have illusions in the police, but to be able to connect with them and turn them against the entire system. This has to be the, uh, the method. Um, and then to steal these people into a united, disciplined, revolutionary organization. Not an organization which just puts up any ideas at any points, or an organization which again just uh, sits in talking amongst itself, but instead one involved in the uh, living class struggle. Unless you fail to do this, you will be torn apart by the um, torrent of bourgeois and petty bourgeois ideas. Uh, you know, revolutionary ideas are not just something uh, that's nice to have. They are essential for unifying our party and turning it into the you know, military-style organization it needs to be in order to lead the working class uh, to victory. Now, unfortunately, we've seen what happens if you don't have this with the last hundred years of experience. Um, and uh, Lenin tried to win the common term to this uh, viewpoint. Cool. Um, that, uh, yeah, Lenin tried to win the uh, communist international uh, to this viewpoint. But unless they took up these perspectives, ideas and methods, they would be completely torn apart.
And in this respect, he sees the revolutionary enthusiasm uh, of these uh, groups, and he refers to it, you know, using this word, an infantile disorder, i.e. childish. Um, now, does he mean childish because of the uh, youth um, and the age? No, uh, both the, all the communist parties were extremely young and the communist international was extremely young. But in the sense of the lack of experience of uh, their organizations, the Bolsheviks had 15 years uh, to clarify their ideas, their methods before taking power. The Communist Party of Germany had uh, one month or less effectively. Um, and therefore, these mistakes that took place before 1917 uh, were very much understandable. The experience of the movement was lacking, um, you know, in the same way that, uh, you know, someone just uh, trying to ride a bike for the first time is probably going to fall over and hurt themselves. In 1920, it was forgivable as it had only been a few years to digest these methods. But today, in uh, 2023 is absolutely criminal to uh, fail to understand the methods and ideas of Bolshevism and Marxism. And in that respect, whilst our organization is very young, um, we are actually very, uh, very old because we base ourselves not off our own individual experience and ideas, but the experience and traditions of the past 100 or 200 years of workers' uh, movements and, uh, you know, in the lessons of revolutionaries, we, ma we stand very much on the shoulders of giants. Now, if you fail to take in, um, yeah, do I have enough time for this? Probably. Uh, yeah, if you fail to take in the uh, dangers uh, of ultra-leftism, they can express themselves in very different ways. You can get, on the one hand, Lenin talks about this idea that uh, from ultra-leftism, you can get this small circle mentality that people are search, uh, eternally searching for the perfect program, position, um, and people to fill the revolutionary party. And ultimately, this comes from a petty bourgeois idea of trying to achieve socialism in one room. Arriving... Um, <laughs> I, that's a genuine position. It's not even a joke. Like, there are many groups who put that forward. Um, and this comes from, you know, uh, people who maybe are overly steeled in abstract discussion circles, uh, who can end up, uh, you know, not unable to apply the ideas of history with the struggle of today, um, who are only able to talk about socialism and Marxism as things that are only applicable in the, the future. Marxism is not a dogma. Uh, it is not something removed from the working class, but instead it is a weapon orientated to the removal of the uh, bourgeoisie and a tool in the hands of revolutionaries, um, it is uh, essential. In fact, the Second Congress would uh, wage war on this. In his opening speech, Zinoviev, uh, who at this time was still okay, um, <laughs> is, uh, would declare that it now is uh, no longer a matter of uh, propaganda for communist ideas. Now the epoch dawns uh, of the organization of the uh, communist proletariat and the immediate struggle for communist revolution. Um, and therefore, it's not the job of the revolutionary is not to sit on the sides, but to get involved in the struggle, to work with the masses hand by hand, and to always have the eye on the future and how we move from our current position to the overthrow of power. Um, in this respect, um, we, uh, our method is yes and, and yes but. We never fall into the uh, sectarian trap of uh, cheerleading the uh, reformist leaders uh, like Corbyn, Zara Sultana, Mick Lynch and the rest. Uh, we don't just go, yeah, they're, they're amazing, they're great, and leave it this. Instead we say, yes, this is very progressive, but or and. Uh, yes, a great strike has been called, this is wonderful. Now, let's link up with other unions to try and uh, spread this struggle. Yes, it's great so many are people involved, but we are simply involved on the basis of my conditions are terrible, your conditions terrible. Let's instead have a joint political program in order to solve this question and this uh, problem. Yes, we need to nationalize the energy companies making billions of pounds of, prob uh, of profit, but do we have faith in... Uh, uh, government bureaucrats more than billionaires? No, we need to put this under democratic workers' control. Um, 
And uh, this is how we always bring forward our program in a positive way, expanding on the left reformists and allowing to work, uh, the workers to draw their own conclusions about who is serious for fighting for reforms in practice. To then go back to these people and say, well, why aren't you in favor of democratic workers' control? Do you not trust us? You know, Zara Sultan, do you not trust us to run our own, uh, our own workplaces? And in doing so, either force the reformists to a revolutionary position, which we're happy with, or expose the limitations of reformists and raise the need for a revolutionary uh, uh, platform. And in this respect, this careful criticism um, is always very different from the, uh, the sectarians who will always begin by attacking the left reformists first, always saying, ah, oh, betrayal, enemy, uh, you know, charlatan, chauvinist, etc." And then understanding why, after attacking their leaders, no workers seem to be uh, interested in getting involved. Instead, we always, first and foremost, attack the Tories, attack the capitalists and the bosses. Then we move on to the right reformists, who are the agents of the bosses in the workers' movements. And then finally, we would attack the left reformists. But not from a place of anger, no, uh, but from a place of sorrow of if only these people had had strong ideas, if only these people had been more willing to fight, if only they had a clear political program, think what could have been achieved. This is the uh, clear political program our organization has. Now, uh, how much time do I have? How much do I want to go through? Okay, I think I can summarize without going too much over. So, one point that some thinking comrades may be thinking at the moment is, is if this is our methods, does going up and down the country posting are you communist uh, posters left, right and center seem a little bit ultra left? Um, because, and I think uh, you know, comrades may be uh, aware, but the broad masses at the moment are not looking towards a communist revolution yet. But the key with tactics is always to take a dialectical viewpoint. It's always to understand things concretely and in their process, uh, not in this timeless abstract way. Are we at the moment trying to win millions of workers? The answer is clearly no. Instead, we are trying to win the ones and twos to a communist organization. Um, and therefore, uh, yeah, our tactics are not fixed by term by our aims. We need to build the first thousand, five thousand, ten thousand. And in this respect, the Are You a Communist campaign is very uh, useful to go and find the best layers at universities or uh, colleges or all of this. It is an incredibly sharp tool to find people on the streets, uh, alienated and passionate against the uh, fight against capitalism. It is incredible. But to try and win over a uh, union, uh, an entire union to a Marxist position, it will completely, uh, completely collapse. And therefore, we need comrades who can think for themselves, who can act on their own, but whilst also acting as part of a uh, disciplined uh, revolutionary organization. Building a revolutionary organization, it's, it's not an equation. Um, it is not simply getting 10,000 people to set up a sub and read what is Marxism and Classics Volume 1. Instead, it is a battle, uh, a living battle, an evolving organism, uh, as the Revolutionary Party adapts uh, itself to changing conditions and seeks to raise the consciousness of the masses as it understands the clear differences we're under. Uh, just to give one example, think of Lenin in 1914. He comes out with a position of revolutionary defeatism, i.e. it is better for the working class to be defeated uh, by the uh, an enemy country than it is for them to give any support to their own bourgeois. Um, why does he put that? It's because he's aiming at a very small layer of hardened revolutionaries fighting against all of the chauvinistic nonsense they've been put by World War, uh, by the collapse of the Second International. But three years later, he's completely changed his tune. He's not saying, ah, oh, yes, Germany needs to uh, invade Russia. That will be great. Instead, he's saying, um, what's the word? That the ruling class are incapable of fighting this war. If you want to defend um, your homeland, you need to, you know, first remove the, uh, the bourgeoisie and only the workers are going to be capable of, you know, uh, defending themselves. Um, 
And these are two ultimately quite contradictory positions. But the reason Lenin puts them forward is not because he was uh, psychotic. It is because uh, he understood the, uh, the, living, uh, the living method. And this is why we need comrades who can think for themselves. This is why theory is so important. Um, and we need comrades who can do this not just when uh, times are easy, but when they are hard. Uh, Lenin, he says the following in Latin comments, and he says, it is far more difficult and far more precious to be a revolutionary when the conditions for direct, open, really mass and really revolutionary struggle do not yet exist. To be able to champion the interests of a revolution by propaganda, agitation and organization in non-revolutionary bodies and quite often in downright reactionary bodies in a non-revolutionary situation among the masses who are incapable of immediately appreciating the need for revolutionary uh, methods of action. This is, if trying to fight for socialist revolution was easy, it would have already been achieved. So instead, we uh, have a very difficult task. We need to ensure we do not fall between opportunism and ultra-leftism and all of these other things. And instead realize that ultimately the root is from a lack of confidence in one's own ideas, from a lack of ability to connect with the struggle, from a lack of practice in the struggle, and uh, you know weakness on all of these points. We then for need a uh, you know an organization of cadres of people who are steeled in theory and dis uh, steeled in theory, who have practiced within the movement, who know how to connect and who can build and train uh, others up, who can repel all bourgeois and petty bourgeois ideas, um, and who can uh, yeah, look at the conditions of the consciousness of today and harness the lessons of the past 200 years of struggle of the first, second, third, fourth international and boil it down into just a few clear and concise sentences in order to win the masses to our uh, banner, whether it is the smallest workplace grievance or the systematic issue of the uh, racism of the police. And not just a handful of people who can do this, not just three or four, but thousands. That is the goal of every single person in, your, in this room. Turn yourself into a cadre who can achieve this, and then go out and t uh, turn five others into cadres as well. If this can be done, then victory will be ours. Thank you very much, Comrade.